<laughs> Take two. All right, now we're going to get started with Sunday School this morning. It's good to see you guys. I, I enjoy standing up here, actually, and watching you guys fellowship. It's, it's actually a, it's a joy to me to see. So, But we do need to, we need to get started with our study. We're going to continue with our introduction to Romans as we start this uh, foundational book. We began last week again with the introduction and this week is part two of the introduction. And if all goes according to plan, uh, which doesn't always, if it goes according to plan, we'll uh, begin the verse by verse uh, next week. So uh, it's not so important how fast we move as, as, as long as we're, you know, we honor the scriptures. So feel free to ask questions, um, speak up, and, and, and um, uh, engage. That's the point. That's one of the reasons why I love to do verse by verse study in a, a um, Sunday school or a Bible study because it allows uh, you guys to interact and interject and, and to raise points. Uh, and so let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you for this time that we have. We thank you for this precious book of Romans that we have, that we can study, that we learn so many of the foundational truths of our position in Christ and our righteousness before you, thanks to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, bless this time that we have. I just thank you for each person here who has a heart's desire and a love for your word. May we speak it and study it in truth to your glory. Amen. Okay. Last week, uh, we, we studied and really looked at the significance of the book of Romans. And we talked about a number of different issues. We talked about how it was not the first in chronology, but the fact that the Holy Spirit still saw fit to put it first as it relates to Paul's writings. And how that's because this is, in my opinion, uh, the reason for that. Uh, it's conjecture on my part to say why, but to me it's, it's a foundational book. It's, it's this book here that lays the foundation uh, for Christianity, and so how important that is. Here we learn that we're sinners, there's God's wrath against sin, and when I say we're sinners, we're sinners in the sense of before we are saved, um, and before we're saved, there's God's wrath being proclaimed here against sin and the fact that we need a, a Savior, and so it's so very important. And so we talked about the, the significance of Romans, and the last thing we spoke about is 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 really that it was the book of Romans that um, um, caused, in many ways, Martin Luther to begin the Reformation. It was the book of Romans that caused him to question the, the mindset and the teaching of the Catholic Church. And, in, and we talked about this term, this belief system called infused grace. Do you remember us talking about that last week? And, and so it was. it's this book that really shows that belief system to be completely unbiblical. And, and by infused grace, we're talking about the doctrine or belief system that through keeping commands, um, the commands of Christ, uh, confession and penance and receiving the sacraments, that God's grace and righteousness is therefore infused upon you by you doing those things. And that is the belief system of the Catholic Church and unfortunately even the Lutheran Church in, in many ways. But it's the book of Romans that challenges that thought. It was the book of Romans in the day of Martin Luther that he began to persuade, be persuaded. And we looked at, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 1. <clears> that challenges the idea that uh, man in any way can work towards righteousness. Uh, it just doesn't work that way. Uh, look at... Uh, Romans 1.16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek, for therein, well, what's therein? The gospel. The gospel. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And so it's, we see in the book of Romans, this first time, this this 
injection of it's not going to be based upon following any commands or even the Mosaic law of, or, or of any, any sort. Unfortunately, tradition crept in in, in the, the early church and it's in replacing the Mosaic law with somehow following some sort of a, a Christ law and you have to follow these, these commands and, and penance and, and all these other types of belief systems, sacraments. That's why here at Grace Bible Fellowship, there is, there is no sacraments that we suggest because a sacrament is an idea that somehow God is going to bestow more grace upon you because of something you do. Now, if you have the mindset that God is going to bestow more grace on you because of something you do, then you desperately need to read the book of Romans and study it because it just doesn't work that way. It is because... Because the Father loved the Son, and because the Son died for us, and because of by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Son, God imputed righteousness onto us. <coughs> Christ's righteousness is now upon us. It has nothing to do with what we do. And the great thing is, is if just like you can't earn it, you can't lose it. Talk about a foundational truth and how this, this book, this is one of the reasons why I believe that it's, First, in, after the book of Acts, because what we've had is from Exodus all the way even through the Gospels, and we've looked at this before, Christ didn't come to say, don't follow the Mosaic law. And so you had from Exodus on all of these books about following the Mosaic law until you get to Romans. Romans is the book that, that changes all of that. Acts is a, a historical narrative, and so we see that presented. But again, that's written as a historical narrative, not so much as a doctrinal instruction letter. And so as we look at the book of Romans and look at these other books that are written, we can not so much, not so much look at what year they've been written. We can look at where they were written in relation to the book of Acts, and that really helps you more. And so that's how significant um, the book of of, of, of Romans is. And so like I said, we, we quickly go from the idea or, or the, all these books about the Mosaic Law to, to look about the righteousness of faith. And that's what Romans 1, or we just read here, righteousness, uh, Romans 1 verses 16 and 17, Romans chapter 4, same type of thing, the righteousness of faith. And so I think, um, I think it's, um, it's no accident that we have the book of Romans, even though it wasn't the first written by Paul. And again, if you remember, if you weren't here for last week, Romans was probably written around the time of Acts chapter 20. And so you can follow those events in, in Acts chapter 20, and that's about the time that, uh, that Romans would have been written. He's writing it um, for, from Corinth. And so um, anyway, I won't uh, continue to pound that point. Any comments or questions before we move on? Yeah. I just had it's a bit of a rabbit hole, but where uh, like uh, ritual and these things that we or that Catholic Church as a prime example has adopted, but other religions, where does the feet washing thing in John, um, you know, where Jesus, who was that instructed to? Or in that symbolism, correct? sure, it'd be more symbolic than actually doing it because we, we do communion, we do you know the Lord's Supper, but the feet washing thing, nobody, I mean. I've seen it a couple of times, actually. I've actually had it done. Yeah, yeah. I was, uh, I was a uh, teacher at a Christian school and uh, taught um, <clears throat> high school technology and a few other, other, other classes. Um, and um, the administrator there called myself and the pastor of that church into the office and... Um, um, proceeded to ask us to remove our feet and to, our shoes and to um, wash our feet. And um, being a rightly dividing person as myself and realizing that Christ was actually teaching his apostles a very important story that they needed to understand. Because remember, those apostles were still walking around asking, talking amongst themselves as Christ is probably walking ahead, which of us is going to be the greatest right. in the kingdom? Yeah. Which of us, and Christ is having to teach them, the greatest is going to be the one who's going to be the least among you. Right. It's going to be your servant. Which obviously is true for us in the sense that, that if, if you're going to be a leader, you better, you have to be a servant. You have to have a servant's heart. 
which is why to me I think one of the most important um, attributes I look at is, is not how many PhDs a person has, is how much humility that person has. You know, I think that's way more important than a bunch of letters after your, after your name. And so um, I, think, I think that, that specific as aspect of washing their feet was a lesson learned to them. The same kind of concept is, is the son of man doesn't even have a pillow to rest his head on. You know, and he came to serve, not to be served. And so he was trying to teach them that lesson. And so with us, again, um, I think God expected, whether it was the nation of Israel or whether it's us, that he, he, he has us here to be servants of him to others. And so that's the purpose behind it. So, All right, so the structure of Romans. Um, basically, if you like outlines, if you're one of those type of people that likes outlines, you'll see chapters 1 through 8 really deal with doctrine. Um, chapters 9 through 11 deal uh, with a dispensational um, situation. And, and we'll look at a couple verses of these uh, here. And chapters 12 through 16 are practical instruction. So chapters 1 through, not, or 1 through 8 are, have to do with doctrine. Look at uh, chapter 3 with me, verse 21. Romans chapter 3, well, let's read verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And so, here we have this doctrinal statement that the righteousness without the law is being been made manifest. It's been brought to the world. And so that's a, a new understanding that wasn't understood before. And again, this, this, this doctrinal, you know, in itself is phenomenal. But again, we see here, this also teaches us the doctrine of progressive revelation. That revelation was progressive over time. And so that's why it's important to study your Bible, not just to read it. And so um, contemplate on these different verses. Uh, look at verse 25 here. It says, whom God has set forth, talking about Jesus, to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare, notice that, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Again, this is a doctrinal understanding of today in the day of grace. Well, it wasn't a doctrinal understanding in the past. And so... Here we see that these, these first eight chapters is just filled with doctrine. Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 5, one of my favorite chapters in the, all of the Bible. Uh, I mean, it's just over and over. We have all of these, these you know, again, foundational understandings of the, for the church today here in these first eight chapters. And chapters 9 through 11, again, are dispensational. And what I mean by that is, is Paul is dealing with the what about Israel question. And so we, we get Paul talking to uh, these Gentiles in such a way as to, to, to give them an understanding of, one, uh, don't be haughty about your position in Christ. And, and, and to me, really, the idea of, of anti-Semitism any idea that um, that there's a biblical belief system, or biblical um, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Justification for that? Romans 9, 10, and 11 is very clear not to, because what Paul is dealing with there is specifically the idea is don't think don't think so high above yourself. And he's talking about uh, the importance of the nation of Israel. It's chapter 11 where he makes it very clear. Paul makes it very clear that the promises of God are going to be fulfilled. Those promises to Israel that are unfulfilled are still going to happen. And so that's what chapters 9 through 11, they deal with the nation of Israel for the most part in the sense of their situation. And um, again, it's, it's in, the, in there where we see that, that he ha Paul says, I have a zeal for them because, uh, because they have a zeal for God, I'm sorry. Um, that they're, they're, they're zealous for God, but they're trying to establish their own righteousness is what, what he says. And so again, chapters 9 through 11, great verses, great chapters to look at when it comes to 
the dispensational aspect when it comes to the nation of Israel. <laughs> and then chapters 12 through 16 are great practical instruction. So when you need counsel and you're going to go to the Word of God, chapters 12 through 16 might have something that's, that's going to speak to you. It's, it's, it's okay, you, you've got this doctrine. You've, we've answered the question about Israel. And now here's what you need to do with it. You've got to apply it and do it within your life. Look at chapter 12. Chris Mills says, good morning. Good morning to you, Chris. Yes, it is. Uh, Romans is an awesome epistle. Yes, it is. Romans chapter 12, verse, verses 1 and 2. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And so we understand that, you know, by the mercies of God, that it's going to be a reasonable service that you do these things. He, he's just got done, you know, giving example after example of what God has done for you. You know, you ever, you ever wondered, you ever heard a pastor say that Scripture says you've been given all spiritual blessings? You ever wonder what those are? You ever sit there and think, well, okay, I know I'm saved, but what else has God done for me? Now, be honest, you ever, you ever wondered that? Yeah. Well, for one, I, I like to tell people that song, Count Your Blessings, get a piece of paper, <clears throat> get a pencil, and start writing them down and count them. And really count them. Wendy. But what is a living sacrifice? Basically the idea that you're going to, uh, not my will uh, be done, but thine own. Understanding that it's, there, there might be things that you want, but that's not in the best interest. Uh, Paul talks about the idea that all things are lawful for me, but then he says what? They're not, all things are not expedient. They're not expedient. They don't build up because there are things that maybe, remember what Paul talks about even your liberty. Don't let your liberty be a stumbling block to others. And so we, we have to understand, which is, again, what we'll be talking about in today's sermon, this idea that, that there is a cause and effect. Um, Things that we do affect other people. And so we have to be willing to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. We, we, we understand that Christ sacrificed himself for us. Now, therefore, it's our reasonable service because we've been purchased at a price to then turn around and present our lives as a living sacrifice back to Christ and so that we live in service to him. Does that make sense? And so... And so that's, that's the concept. That's the idea is that we want to, this is our reasonable service. We have a vocation. We have a job. Verse 2, and be ye not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The scriptures are very, very clear in the idea that that all scripture is profitable for all of these things. And he lists these for instruction in righteousness, for, for reproof and all this. And then it says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished. And so we have to understand, as it says here, that uh, don't be conformed to this world. What do you think he wants, Paul's telling us to be conformed to? Christ. But yet oftentimes we see whether it's today it's no different. In that day and age, Paul was dealing with the same thing. Paul calls out people. Matter of fact, do you guys recognize the name Demas in Scripture? You don't want to be a Demas, you know. Demas was somebody who was a fellow a laborer with Paul, but then it says, it says that he loved the world more, and so Paul calls him out because he began to love the world, and he began to be conformed to this world. And so we see that Romans not only gives us a bunch of information, it tells us now you got to, here's what you got to do with it. You got to take it and do something with it. It's kind of like at your job. You know, you work at your job. They, you can get, get all kinds of knowledge in the world. You know, you ever worked a manufacturing job? And just for an example, you've got a conveyor system going by. You're taught how you got to do. Well, what profit are you to the company if you've been told what to do, but yet you just stand there and do nothing? You've been given the knowledge. And so these practical instructions here is now telling us, okay, 
taught you how to work the conveyor belt, now go do it. Apply it. Yeah. Might the um, uh, put on, put off mm -hmm. uh, in Ephesians address that? Like, because you put something off, then there, there's a void, presumably. Mm -hmm. And if you don't put something on, eventually you'll backslide. And possibly, I mean. No, I, I'm not smiling at your comment because your, your comment's dead on. <laughs> I'm smiling because this happens all the time. Yeah. And what I mean by that is this is the topic of today's message, is this kind of a thing. And it wasn't because of this study, um, but that point right there is part of the whole concept. There is this put off and put on. And one of the things we have to understand, one of the difference between Romans and, and what, it, what it's teaching us and then the law is the law and legalism, all of that stuff, even like infused grace and sacraments and doing this and doing that. The difference is, is the law is, is, is very good at telling you what to put off. Grace tells you what to put on. Grace takes you from the idea of don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Grace is the idea of he did this, he did this, he did this, so you go do this. It's a totally different concept. And so, yeah, put off, put on is, is I think, very much, um, I hate trying to say this word because I always mess it up, applicable. Whew. Not saying it anymore. <laughs> I think last week I tried to say it three times, one time's too many, and it didn't work out too well. And so, yeah, brother, I think you're exactly right. The idea of put off and put on, because we do, we understand more, many people, um, you know, get caught up in, in sin in their life and, and, and whatever the case may be. And, and if you're going to put off, you need to put on something else. You need to replace it with something. And so um, that's it's very practical very, very practical instruction. So, it's even true with children because you keep taking stuff away, but you don't give them something else. They get so frustrated. Yep. And that's why we have, I believe, a lot of frustrated uh, sure. people trying to live for the Lord is because they just know what they're not supposed to do, but they don't understand what they are supposed to do. Yep. Great, great point. Great illustration too, because one of the differences you see about. Uh, parents who raise themselves kids in a biblical way versus those that may even want to. Maybe they don't, but maybe some that want to, but they don't really know how to. Their parents are very big at don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, instead of bringing them to a point of let's go do this. And and so that's a great, great point, Lenny. So, all right, uh, that structure, by the way, this uh, 1 through 8 and, and then uh, 9 through 11 and 12 through 16, uh, indicates that there's a purpose behind this book, and meaning that there's an intelligent author behind this book. This isn't just the ramblings of some guy who was in Corinth and didn't have a bunch to do that day, and so, yeah, let me write a book. You know, let me go write a letter. There is a purpose and a design behind this book. And to me, I think that that, again, speaks volumes and should speak volumes to us as we consider it. And so within these different, um, different sections, I should say, these, this different structure, um, you know, like say between chapters 1 through 7, each of them have their sub structures to them. And so like in, in that first section between chapters 1 through 8, you might see chapter 1 verses 1 through 7 where, where Paul is declaring the fact that he is an apostle and he's thankful and praying for them. If you read verses 1 through 7, that's really what that is talking about. One, that he's an apostle and that he's thankful for those who are in Rome and that he's praying for them. And then you can break it down from there. Verses 16 and 17, we see that, we, that the gospel is the power of God. And I, I, I like to, you know, to really drive that home because the power of God, uh, it, it's, it, it means quite a bit. Verses 18 through 23, we see God's wrath is going to be upon man because he chose not to glorify God. See, we have this mindset today that we see through the world from this side of history. And so, well, what about all those people that don't know? Well, God's not looking at it from this side of history. God's looking at it from that side, well, and, and actually both sides. 
And this is, and, and we see in, here in these verses that God is making a declaration that, that the wrath of God came upon man because man chose not to glorify God as God. And so we get this declaration here. And so you can be comforted in knowing that God is not a God who's one so quick to anger to reject us. You don't have to try to defend a God that isn't a loving God. Our God is a loving God. He's a long-suffering God. He's a God that took a world of man who rejected him, every single one, and still made something out of it. Still did something with it. And so, to me, I think that's uh, that's an interesting thing. And then chapter 1, you know, you have those final verses, chap- verses 24 through 32, that as a result of God's, uh, of man deciding not to glorify God as God, verses 24 through 32, you get the explanation that as a result of that, there was a do- downward spiral of corruption and depravity. Let me say that again. So you have in those verses 18 through 23 that God's wrath is on man because man chose not to glorify God as God. And then from 24 to 32, the result is there was a downward spiral of corruption and depravity. That, again, I mean, it's not specific in the sense of of chapters 12 through 16 where it's a specific instruction for you. But if you're willing to think and say, well, wait a minute, if that's the warning of what happened, then I should probably not do that myself, right? We probably don't want to go down that road, which means in our practical understanding of our lives that we need to make sure that we continue to glorify God as God, and how do I do that in my daily life? How is it do I I make sure that I'm not setting up an idol in my life, whether it's me or whether it's something else, and I make sure that I don't fall down because the farther we get away from God, the farther we're going to get away from truth, the farther we're going to get away from everything that's good, it's going to be a downward spiral. And so that's what I see is is chapter 1, is this little um, um, sub-structure. So again, you have those three, I think, main um, sections, but then within them you you see these little secondary structures and uh, I think those are very interesting any comments before we move on from there okay the the next thing I really want to talk about in this introduction to Romans is the audience the audience of the book of Romans and again Romans um, sets the stage is is the is the um, word do I want to use here it it, it, again it's the foundation for what comes ahead and what I mean by that is is that well look at Romans chapter 1 verse 7 Romans chapter 1 verse 7 because most people I shouldn't say most people think don't fall into the idea that this is written to a nation God is not dealing with nations anymore, which is very interesting from this book because all of the other books that we've had up until this point chronologically, they are written to a nation, the nation of Israel. The book of Genesis was written to the nation of Israel. It was written by Moses. All of the Old Testament was specifically to the nation of Israel. Doesn't mean it wasn't for you, but here we get the first one that's not to a nation. Notice what it says, to all that be in Rome. So it's those who are in Rome, it's to the Jew and the Gentile alike. And so it's not to a nation, and even that should tell us something. It's to all that are there. And and that is significant to understand. And so this has Jewish and Gentile people in mind. Um, And and again, that is is quite different. Um, Because God is not dealing with, with nations anymore. Yes. One, uh, it, it, this isn't original to me, but it's in the notes at, before the book of Romans in my Bible. And it basically says that Romans is the book of leveler. In other words, it takes you, if you're a Jew and thinking pretty high of yourself, or if you're a Roman thinking pretty high of yourself, whatever you are, whatever nation you're from, mm-hmm. it just levels you out to be nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so 
you got to go there before you can see what Christ has done for you. Sure. Yeah, I, I would say that's a good way to put it because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Pulls everybody out. Yeah, and so we're all in this same 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 situation that we we have to. How is it? You know, I, I I gave a sermon a while back. I don't remember when it was. How to be right with God? The, there's many people who've lived their lives and never asked that question. They don't care, and how how important that is. You know, is there a God? He that comes to God must first believe that He is. The Book of Hebrews says. So you have to first believe there is a God, um, and so then if there is a God, I kind of want to make sure I'm on the right side with God. I mean, we're so busy, um, meaning mankind, <coughs> making sure that we're on the right side. We've got the right baseball team or got the right football team or, you know, I, I'm in with the right crowd at work or, or whatever. I'm networking well. Well, I'll tell you what, the, best, the first thing you better find out is, is how you better be right with God. And so the book of Romans, again, puts us all on the same on field and, and says, <laughs> you can't be right with God unless you do it God's way. And so the book of Romans uh, does that very well. And so, yes, the, the, the book is written to those who are in Rome, both Jew and Gentile. You'll see parts in here where Paul is talking directly to, the, to a Gentile. And then he'll be talking like he's talking specifically to a Jew. And so he's talking to all those who, who are at Rome, which, again, is, is a much different situation. And, and, and I think that he's writing to multiple churches here, not just one particular church. There is multiple churches, it appears, from Romans 16 that's been set up. Um, and uh, he mentions, mentions two of them. And so uh, I think that he's, he's got a letter, and, and, and he gives this letter to Phoebe. And, and Phoebe, this fantastic minister for Christ, serving with Paul, is given this letter. And, and you want to talk about... You know, you know, whenever we get to glory and we get to meet some of these people, I mean, Phoebe doesn't get a lot of credit here. But in her hands, going from Corinth to Rome is the foundational book of Christianity. I mean, that gives me chills to think about. And, and the importance of what God placed in this woman's hands. I mean, it's just, just phenomenal. And so there's, there's multiple churches going on. Uh, that we can see um, in in Romans 16, which chances are we'll, we won't get there for about a year. So, <laughs> but uh, look at, uh, um, well, before we go there, um, understand that this group of, of, of churches was not directly planted by Paul. Paul had not been to Rome yet. Um, he's going to go to Rome. He talks about the fact that he's been hindered to going there. Look at chapter 15, Romans chapter 15, verse 22. Here he, again, remember in Romans 1, he expressed his, um, his, the fact that he, he's... Um, been praying for them and the fact that uh, he longs to be there. And in here we see in chapter 15, verse 22 uh, and 23, that he's been hindered. Verse 22 says, For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you, but now having no more place in these parts. I want to know the back, I want to know the history behind that. You know, and again, Book of Acts helps us have that. And having a great desire. Um, these many years to come unto you. And so uh, we see that Paul has not been to Rome yet at the time of this writing. Uh, and so uh, there's, there's a lot of question about by some on you know, how the book of, uh, how the churches of Rome were, were um, set up, and um, which we'll talk about here in a second. Turn to Acts chapter 19 with me, verse 21. Here we see, um, again, I, I believe that um, with other scholars, I shouldn't say other, with scholars, I don't say other because that would include myself in that. Um, I, I, I do agree from studying that, that the book of uh, Romans was written 
in the Acts timeline of Acts 20, but here in chapter 19, uh, verse 20, 21, um, it says, After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. And so, again, as, as far as Acts 19 at that point, he still hadn't been to Rome. At the writing of the book of Romans, he still hasn't been to Rome. And so uh, you, you have this belief system also out there that Peter started the church in Rome. And l let me be clear, if, if, if you don't already understand this, there's not one shred of evidence to suggest that. There's nothing that suggests that Peter um, founded the group in, in, in Rome. Now, on the contrary, though, there's many evidence biblically that suggests that he wouldn't have done so. In other words, there's nothing in the Bible that says that Peter did it. There's nothing, there's no proof. There's, there's, there's people who, um, who came later that, that you know, espouse the idea that Peter did it. And those are the same people who, who um, are already a couple generations away from those who have, have forsaken Paul and his ministry. And what do they do? They're not rightly dividing. They believe the church is built on the foundation, not of Paul's teaching, but on Peter's teaching. And so who do they suppose is the, the, the line of uh, ascension or descension? They say through Peter. And so you have this idea that Peter did it. Well, there's no evidence for it. Nothing. And, and, and it's, it's interesting how many people actually believe that. What we do know is that, um, um, well, look at Romans 15 again. Or I think you're actually still there. Ver look at verses 19 through 20. Romans 15, verses 19 through 20. Let's look at some verses to show why um, the scripture would, would suggest that Peter would not be the one to do it. Romans 15, 9 through, through 20. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem round about unto Lysium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so I have strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Paul, Paul is not desiring to go preach where Christ is already named. Well, first of all, you have to understand that Peter and the Twelve said that they would keep their ministry to Jerusalem, to the circumcision, to Israel. And so Paul's, Paul says here that he, he's striving to preach, preach where Christ is not made. And so the mere fact that Paul is writing a doctrinal thesis to Rome should tell us what? That, that none of the apostles... None of the, the authorities of God have been there. Now, we do see, and I do believe, that there are those from Paul who've gone there, and you have believers, but when it comes to that apostolic level, that, that the idea that this, this, this authority and this teaching, the, the, one who, the one who is speaking with God, Paul says that from the abundance of revelations, I've been given this, um, this, this thorn in the flesh. Now, we usually concentrate on the thorn in the flesh, but what did we miss? The abundance of revelations. And so Paul is, is getting continual revelations from God. And so the mere fact that he says, I'm not longing to go to, to speak where Christ has already been named. Um, he's not looking to, to circum, circumvent Peter's ministry. No, and so I don't think it makes sense whatsoever. And look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I'm going to have to pick up the pace. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 10. It's a very, very interesting verse. Uh, we don't have time to, sp to spend a whole lot of time on it, um, but it's very important. Uh, verse 10 says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds thereon. But let every, let every man take heed how he builds thereon. Now, you understand that you are building upon that foundation that Paul, Paul laid. You are somebody who is building upon it. 
-hmm. Here it says, take heed how you do it. But the other thing to understand here is, is Paul is claiming, which is consistent where he says, my gospel, my gospel. He's saying, I've laid that foundation. Well, he can say that because he's, he's been given a dispensation. He's been given an administration. He is the apostle of the Gentiles. He has, he has that position. And it's, yeah. Now, uh, just for me and Peter and laying to rest, uh, the whole Rome issue, really, uh, Galatians 2.9. 2, 2, 8 through 10, yeah. really. Which uh, is where we're going to go next, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So let's go there. Tim is exactly right. Finish your comment, though. No, I was just going to say it seems uh, very, very clear where mm -hmm. the direction was uh, as, as laid out in Scripture. Yep. Galatians 2. Um, says in verse 9, when James Cephas... Well, let's read verse 8, uh, as Tim suggested. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision... The same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, Cephas is Peter, when James, Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the heathen, heathen as Gentiles, and they unto the circumcision. And so only that we should remember the poor, um, as it says there. And so... By, by Peter, if Peter went to establish the church in Rome, these Gentiles, Peter wouldn't be fulfilling his own obligation that he, he considered himself under. And so this is what I'm saying. The biblical idea that Peter did that, it doesn't seem to make sense, but it sure fits nice if you want to be the Pope. <laughs> so. And the 12 never made it out of Israel anyway, I mean, other than we see, uh, if you didn't hear that, Val said in the 12 never made it Israel. We do see Peter um, going to visit Paul on a couple of occasions. But as far as a ministry outside of Israel, you don't see it in the Bible. You see James writing to, to strangers, um, but he's talking to Israel still, 12 tribes. Yeah. Right. Paul is establishing a new foundation that is just faith by grace. And so there are two gospels in this Romans right here mm -hmm. that they're talking about. Sure. Yeah, and, and, and that's a good way to, to understand it here is is that again, it's not to diminish Peter. It's not to um, rob Paul to pay Peter. Um, you know, people like to say, Well, don't rob Peter to pay Paul. Um, yeah, kind of need to, you know, in some people's minds. If, if you're thinking that you're following the foundation of Peter, well, you know, really what you're doing is you're robbing Paul and, and, and really robbing God because Peter has had, had an enormous ministry. It just wasn't to you. That's what it is. It just wasn't to you. It was to the nation of Israel. His job was to preach to the Jews only. Look at Acts chapter 11. Paul's... Remember, as you turn to Acts chapter 11, remember whenever Paul was saved, according to Acts chapter 20, 26, whenever he was saved in the timeline of Acts 9, he was sent to, um, to, to the Gentiles right away. Peter wasn't. Acts chapter 11. Look here at uh, verse 19. It says, Now when they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen. Now, stop there for a second. Keep in mind, the, the ironic thing is here is, is that this commotion this is referring to has a lot to do with this guy Paul, because Paul was there. Paul was kind of the one in charge at Stone, Stephen Stoney. And there was a bunch of commotion that went place, and you go back to Acts chapter 8, and the Jews, all but the apostles, scattered. They all scattered. And who stayed back was the 12, which is significant. Why did they stay? Well, because Jesus said they had to. Okay? And so you get here, and it says that they scattered about. Now, notice who it says they preached to. Read in verse 1 just again. And when Peter, uh, I'm sorry, uh, where'd I go? 
There we go. Now, when they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch. Doesn't say anything about going to Rome. Preaching the word to what? None but the Jews only. You see, Peter's ministry in the Twelve wasn't to the Gentiles. It certainly wasn't to go start a church in Rome. And so the idea of, of, of Rome being uh, started, the church in Rome being started by, um, by Peter is just tradition, and I think that it has to do with a convenient tradition, a tradition that, um, again, has, has helped uh, a certain group of people try to grab power and hold on to power, and that they can decide who's going to be saved, and you've got to come to us and give us money, or we're not going to, you know, blah, 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 and all kinds of things which is so totally contrary to what, what the scriptures teach. And so, but we do know that um, it was many friends of Paul who, who is at this place. Look at Romans 16 real quick. Give me one minute to finish this up. Romans chapter 16. Starting in verse 1. Romans 16, 1, I commend unto you, unto you is the same group that chapter 1, who he's writing to, all you be at Rome. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centria, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that you assist her in whatsoever business she has need of you, for she hath been a succor of many and of myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, You've heard those names before with Paul. Well, guess where they're at? Rome. These are friends of Paul's. Helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. And see, we see this idea that there's multiple churches at this point that's been established. Salute my well-beloved, and he goes on to name these different people. Greet Mary, salute Andronicus and Junia. And you see all of these people that Paul already knows. Now, Paul didn't go to Rome and start that church, but you can bet it was established based upon his doctrine. You can bet that it was his friends, his fellow workers, who ended up going there and started these churches. Mike. Yeah, well, that was my question. What is Priscilla and Aquila from when they were saved to this point, would they have had time to go to Rome and, and, and really witness mm -hmm. and set up the churches? Sure, sure, yeah. And, and so I think that that's what we're seeing here is, is that Paul himself was hindered to go to Rome. He couldn't go. But again, Paul is, is I mean, he, an apostle, an evangelist. He's preaching, he's teaching, he's doing all these things. And sometimes he's speaking to people who are on their way to the next town. And sometimes he's established people. We saw that, we see that he sent uh, Titus uh, to Crete. We see that he sends Timothy to Ephesus. He sends him to Corinth. He sends him all, to all, all kinds of places. And you have these people who went to Rome and established this church. And so again, the audience of, of, of the book of Romans is Jew and Gentile. It's a number of different churches. It's churches in which there is an, uh, a, a, a group of people there who have followed under the authority and teaching of Paul. And now he's writing this book. This, he's not been able to get there. And he's writing to them, and which is applicable. Oh, I said it a second time. I'm not going to push my luck on that one. Um, it's, it's, it's also to us, and it is the foundational book of, of doctrine for you and for me. So... All right, any last comments? Yeah. Going back to Acts eleven nineteen, mm -hmm. and now those who were scattered after the persecution, those were Jews uh, that mm -hmm. were scattered, and uh, and then uh, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's outside of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. So at that point in time, the mystery was not in effect yet, correct? Or it wasn't, hadn't been implemented or hadn't been? Well, I think the dispensation had, had been begun in the sense it was, it was given the Apostle Paul. But keep in mind, Paul was saved in the Acts timeline and of Acts chapter 9. And 
Then he goes into Damascus, and he spends some time there. And then we find later that he goes and spends three years in Arabia, and he's learning under the risen Christ. And so in Acts chapter 11, we see Paul now in Antioch. And so uh, between Acts chapter 9 and Acts chapter 11, um, there has been, you know, at least three years. And so has the, has the, the gospel of the grace of God began? Yes. Does... Does um, the people in Jerusalem know about it and understand it? No. Uh, does Paul know it and understand it? Uh, to, to whatever degree he did, we know that he had an abundance of revelations that continued on for many years. But according to Acts chapter 26, he was immediately commissioned for his job as an apostle to go to Jew and to Gentile. So, so, that, so who is preaching the word to no one but the Jews only? The people who were scattered. And so in Jerusalem, you had an Acts, turn to Acts chapter 8. In Acts chapter 8, which is right after Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7 is you have the stoning of Stephen, which Saul was involved in. And because of, of that event, there is basically, you know, all kinds of turmoil that's going on. <coughs> verse Chapter 8, verse 1, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so you have the apostles who stick behind, but you have the other people that are ready to skedaddle and say, I'm out of here. Thanks to Paul. Thanks, Yeah, thanks to Paul. And so you had those people that are talked about in Acts 11, which the event historically takes place in, in Acts chapter 8. Um, it's those same people. They leave, they leave Jerusalem, and they go to all these other places, and they begin to preach that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. He is all those things that the Jews in Jerusalem are teaching. That's what these in Acts chapter 11 are going to teach. They're not teaching that, um, they're not teaching Romans truth. They don't understand because it wasn't given to them. It was given to Paul. Matter of fact, we know this because Acts chapter 15, I know, I can't say, I can't answer any question short. Acts chapter 15, we know. Now, last I checked, Acts chapter 15 is after Acts chapter 11, right? And after Acts chapter 8. Well, in Acts chapter 15, they're still trying to decide whether they don't understand that you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. So they certainly didn't understand the truth of the book of Romans. Acts 15, 1, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the matter of Moses, you can't be saved. And the rest of the verses says, Paul picked up his tent, went back to Jerusalem to argue with them and say, That's not the case. Quit, quit coming down here and saying this. And so, as late as Acts chapter 15, the people, the, those, those in Jerusalem, they're not teaching that. You go to Acts chapter 22, Paul goes back to Jerusalem again, and he begins to tell them all the great things that are happening. And what's James's response? Oh, that's great, Paul, but look at all these people here in Jerusalem and how they're, they're what was, what's the word? Their, their zeal for the law, <coughs> of following the law. Well, here Paul is writing the book of Galatians saying, don't worry about the law. James is saying, look at all these, these people who've been converted and they're so zealous of the law. So you can, again, when you, when you begin to tie all these things in, you see that, that um, no, the idea that, uh, the idea that um, um, any of the 12, Peter included, went to Rome and began to establish the gospel, the grace of God in Rome, it just doesn't fit biblically. It doesn't, matter, it doesn't work. So... Well, in, in Acts 11, just a little further down, Paul, Barnabas goes to get Paul. Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 11, yeah. The yep. Yeah, I mean, uh, whenever there's Gentiles, you know, there, uh, Barnabas has thought, well, I better go get Paul. So, um, anyway, all right, yeah. Yep. Yep. The first, uh, um, it's kind of like whenever you're a child, say you got a sibling, all of a sudden you hear mom or dad yelling, 
and you kind of the first thing you're wondering <coughs> talking to me or or Johnny you know and you, you better figure out who they're talking to and so one of the first questions you're going to ask whenever you approach a scripture is who is it talking to it doesn't mean that you're not going to be able to gleam truths out of it there's plenty of things that you can understand from the Old Testament if you've been here if you listen to me you know that I, I believe that uh, wholeheartedly but that doesn't mean that it was written to me and so yeah it's this mixture and think that oh I can go pull up Ezekiel and think it's talking about me I know a lot of people that make that mistake it's not talking to you and so um, that's brother Kevin's big ball of confusion yep big ball of confusion yep <laughs> and when Mike sorry when no. Mike, Mike said uh, thank Paul right away I thought thank Saul yeah. Right. And and that shows that God even used him when he was such a an adversary mm -hmm. to any Christians or anyone in that belief and still managed to use him. Yeah. There's so many moments in scripture that it'd be fantastic to have been able to witness and the look on Saul's face whenever he whenever he said, Who art thou, Lord? and he says, uh, I'm Jesus. Yeah. You know, can you imagine the look on his face? And so anyway. Okay, great study. Next week we'll uh, uh, move on to chapter 1, verse 1. So.